very much. No pressure on my talk then. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to be here um, in Hall A. Uh, thank you to everyone who came to my previous talk and has come to this one. Nice to see friendly faces again. Um, so yeah, my name is Grace Jansen. If you can't tell from my accent, I'm not from Bulgaria. Um, I'm afraid I speak no Bulgarian, um, and I'm from England. So I work at IBM over in our developer lab over there. I'm a developer advocate. Before I was a developer advocate, I did a biology degree. Uh, so, an obvious transition from Fish to Java. So, if you fancy chatting about that later, happy to chat about that. Uh, but now I do lots of different things around sort of, I make tutorials, demos, I do presenting like this uh, in my developer advocacy role around cloud native technologies, Java, um, and Open Liberty. So, today I'm going to be taking a look at, through the looking glass, effective observability for cloud native applications. So really digging into how we can effectively utilize tools to be able to understand how our applications are behaving in real time in the wild. So why this name through the looking glass? So some of you guys might be familiar with this phrase. It originally comes from the book Alice Through the Looking Glass, which is the follow on to Alice in Wonderland, which many of you might have read the book or seen the movie. Um, but it was essentially a phrase that was coined by the author Lewis Carroll. And really, it's, it's a way of expressing, sort of passing through something. So it's a metaphor for you know, a world that seems unfamiliar that suddenly appears. In the book, Alice steps through a mirror to be able to enter back into Wonderland. And this kind of theme and this metaphor isn't only used in Alice in Wonderland, it's also used in some other media as well. So if you're not familiar with this film, you might be familiar with this film. Anyone know it? Yeah, I got a few nods. The Matrix. So actually, it's really interesting. In The Matrix, there are lots of references to Alice in Wonderland. So for those of you who are Matrix fans, you're probably already aware. But if we think about it, right to the beginning of the movie, Neo gets woken up by his computer, sending him a direct message instructing him to follow the white rabbit. And obviously, the lady has a white rabbit tattoo. There's one reference. Another one is when he's offered the red or the blue pill, um, it, the guy who offers it to, it to him basically says, if you take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. If you take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. So this is a, sort of a metaphor that's used time and time again in different media to really express this whole being able to see with, with new eyes, being able to see a world that you weren't able to understand before. And this is the kind of thing we're trying to achieve when it comes to enabling observability into our cloud native applications. Whereas previously, it might have been a bit easier for, under, for us to understand how our applications were behaving when we were running on local servers, when we could access that application all the time, when it wasn't distributed. When it comes to distributed cloud native applications running on remote servers, this can be a little bit more difficult. So really, the question I'm asking here is, OK, what looking glass do we need to be using? So in this presentation today, I'm going to be covering these main topics. So the why, the what, the how, and then diving into some of the technologies that can enable this that are open source. So I'm afraid there are no excuses, because this is free, and you should be able to use it. Um, so yeah, taking a look at that, obviously got a demo, because we're developers, and we like to see how it works, uh, and then just some summary and resources. So hopefully that gives you a clearer idea of sort of how we're going to structure this session today. OK, so starting with the why. Why do we need observability in the first place? Why are you sat in this room? So if we take a look at sort of how we've arrived at where we are today, evolution of both our infrastructure and our applications has played a key role in this. In terms of our infrastructure, you know, we've moved from sort of what used to be using things like single core. We can now take advantage of multi-threading, multiple cores, utilizing virtualization, containerization, having this inherent distributed nature in the cloud um, to be able to get sort of immediate response from our apps. But all of this has sort of our underlying infrastructure has evolved to, to be able to utilize these technologies and tools. And as a result, 
our applications have also evolved alongside our infrastructure. So what used to be a very often very large monolithic application often is now broken down into remote microservices or even macroservices or serverless, depending on how you're architecturing your application. But really, now, the key part here is that this is kind of becoming a bit more complex, both for infrastructure and for our applications. So why do we do it? Why do we move to the cloud if it's harder and it's more complex? And I think the answer is in this. OK, hopefully you've seen Toy Story. I had a few giggles. If you've not, go and watch that movie. It's amazing. Um, so it's this excitement we get as developers, this, ooh, the cloud. We get excited as developers because it offers us innovations and behaviors that we weren't able to achieve before. Flexibility, portability, dynamic scaling, for example, resiliency. All of these behaviors are enabled through this innovation in the infrastructure and our applications. So it's the reason that we want to move our applications to the cloud and that we put up with all of this complexity and have to deal with it. However, it doesn't always feel like this when we're actually moving our applications to the cloud. It can often feel a bit more like this. It's just a bit frustrating. It doesn't work half the time. You can't see what's going on in your applications. Trying to actually understand what's happening in real time to your real app for real customers can be quite hard. And so that's why we're here in this talk. That's the why. Because we want to move to the cloud, and we want to do it effectively and not get this feeling. So to do that, often we look towards sort of methodologies uh, to be able to guide us in terms of, OK, how do we effectively develop for the cloud? And one popular methodology that I quite like is the 15-factor app methodology. Some of you guys might have come across the 12-factor application methodology. This is just an extension of it to expand it to 15 factors. And I've made your job super easy because I've highlighted the new factors. So it should be super easy to see them. Uh, we've added API first, uh, authentication and authorization, and importantly here, telemetry. Uh, if you are interested to find out more about the factors that I'm not mentioning here, so everything other than telemetry, I've got an article at the bottom here, which is 15 factors, and it takes you through the additional factors that are in there if you want to learn more. But importantly here is this addition of telemetry that I want to focus on in terms of it's now recognized as an important critical step towards building effective cloud native apps. You might look at this list and say, yeah, but we already had logs. Like, why do I need telemetry? And while logs were a really great starting point, especially for sort of local development and understanding how our apps are behaving as we develop, they're not necessarily great insight into how our applications behave in the wild. It doesn't give us insight into, do we have enough resource allocation? What's the load like on our system? Are our microservices healthy or not? So gaining this additional uh, telemetry data can really help in understanding not just our apps as we develop them, but our apps when we throw them into the wild and see how they behave. So this is, you know, it's, it's really emphasizing the importance here that it's been added to this methodology. And there are many other organizations that highlight its importance as well. This is uh, from a website from Splunk. Splunk is, uh, they offer an observability platform, so they're kind of experts within this area. They also helped to form and create open telemetry, which we'll cover later. But you can see here that they clearly point out key uh, sort of reasons of why it's important as well. Things like improving performance, centralizing your data, so having that central point of truth that you can understand what's going on in your application, being able to integrate with that data easily, uh, and being able to troubleshoot faster. And all of these factors come back to those original reasons we want to do cloud native. Resiliency, speed, dynamic scaling, being able to actually achieve those utilizing observability. So that's kind of my why, hopefully, you guys are in the room. So hopefully, I've covered all your reasons um, and some more. So we're onto the what now. Now that we know that we need effective observability, what do I actually mean by this? Because it's a term that can be used for, I would say, multiple different things. So I'm trying to make it clear as to what I mean by this term. So I've got a general understanding here, a general definition. So generally, uh, observability is the extent to which you can understand the internal state or condition of a complex system based on your knowledge of external outputs. So it's all about turning whatever's transmitted out of that system into valuable insights to understand what's going in that system, what's going on inside. The more observable a system, 
the more quickly and accurately we can then navigate to an identified problem, solve it, and understand its root cause so without needing to do additional testing or coding, et cetera. Um, this term observability actually comes from control theory. This is an area of engineering concerned with automating the control of a dynamic system. So if you think, for example, of the flow of water through a pipe or the speed of an automobile over inclines or declines, this is all based on feedback from a system. So this is kind of where this term comes from. So that's the general definition. But we're in tech. We like to be specific. We like to know how it relates to us. So how does it relate to us? This is a more sort of specific definition where we're really referring to software tools and practices, looking at aggregating and correlating and analyzing a steady stream of performance data from a distributed application. Um, and that includes the hardware and the network that it's running on, as well as our application and microservices themselves, and being able to monitor, troubleshoot, and debug that. So getting a bit more specific here in terms of relating it to our jobs and to what we do as software developers. So this is what I mean by observability in terms of the term we're going to be using throughout this presentation. Now, some of you might think, OK, so this is all about understanding the internal state of a system. It's all about understanding you know, the performance metrics we're getting. How does that differ from monitoring? Because I've got monitoring tools, for example, already in my application. So I would say that monitoring uh, and observability are two separate terms, but one can help the other. So monitoring, I would say, is sort of, it's all about using tools and techniques to highlight that an issue has occurred. It could raise a warning, for example, if your average response time gets too slow, or you've got a growing number of requests coming into a particular microservice, or maybe literally that your application has crashed. However, what I say with observability is that that's the ability to measure the internal state of a system by examining its outputs. So when you make an application observable, it provides detailed visibility into its behavior and allows you to identify the root cause. So observability and monitoring are different. Observability doesn't replace monitoring. It just enables better monitoring um, and better sort of application performance monitoring and network performance monitoring. So it's really this more, it's more of a broader catch-all term that can include monitoring and help to make that more effective. Um, so monitoring tools could be included in your observability sort of plan for your application or strategy. So hopefully I provided a bit of a sort of distinction between those two terms there and how they correlate and sort of intertwine together. OK, so that's the what. Now we're on to the how, because that's what we all want to know here, is how do we actually go about achieving this? So there are generally three steps in terms of actually implementing observability. When it comes to implementing it, it's actually fairly uh, simple in terms of the concept itself. To enable observability, you need to firstly instrument your systems and applications to collect the relevant data. If we've got no data, there ain't no point. So we need to be building that into our application so that we can actually do something with that data. So that's the first step, instrumentation. Second step, we need to be able to send this data to a separate external system that can then store and analyze it. It's all well and good getting data out of your system. If you're not doing anything with it, again, there's not really much point. And the third part is providing visualizations and insights into systems as a whole. So utilizing that stored data and that analysis to be able to actually visualize what's going on in our system. Because you know, we could be the cleverest people in the room. We could be super into numbers. But reading a graph is a lot easier and a lot simpler to be able to understand trends and issues within your systems rather than just looking at a database of numbers. So that's a really key step is providing that visualization and understanding of that insight so you can actually do something about it. So we're going to be focusing mostly on the first step in this presentation. Um, I do have a couple of slides on step two and three, but um, we're mostly focusing on step one. So how do we instrument that data? Um, and then we'll look at how we can sort of plug into other tools that can enable two and three. OK, so for step one, um, how do we make a system observable? Well, it's all about instrumentation. And what do we mean by this? It's, it's mostly about these three key pillars. What often is referred to as the pillars of observability, hence my lovely Greek uh, temple, I guess you'd call it. So the three key pillars are logs, metrics, and distributed traces. So really, our code should be emitting all of these. Um, and I say there's three pillars. 
there is hopes that eventually these pillars will expand. So there's already discussions going on at the moment into two more additional pillars in observability that may be added to projects like OpenTelemetry. That includes things like end user monitoring and profiling. So end user monitoring is really about gaining real time visibility into how our users are experiencing our application. Um, so it can be you know, video recordings of them using our application, tracking how their, their path moves through our application, for example. Um, so understanding end user experience. And then profiling offers us a way to understand sort of where our code spends its time uh, on which hardware resources, primarily things like memory and CPU, um, right down to the individual line number. So understanding which lines in our code take up the most time and take up the most resources. So it's hoped that eventually these will be included and sort of incorporated into that. But at the moment, it's mostly the three core pillars that are focused on. So that's what we're going to focus on today uh, and how we can go about achieving that. So the first is logs, which many of you are probably already using. It was mentioned in the 15 factor as a separate factor. Um, and this is really, you know, they're found almost everywhere in software and have been heavily relied upon by developers and operators to really understand system behavior. Unfortunately, the sort of downfall of logs is that they aren't extremely useful when it comes to tracking code execution. They typically lack contextual information, such as where they were called from, for example. And so they become far more useful when they're actually used within something that can provide that contextual information. In this case, when they're used within traces. So they are really helpful in terms of understanding specific information, like an error or a warning. Um, typically, you'll be storing them in log files. But the awkward part is, is that we don't really know what caused them. So that's why this isn't the single sole source of observability. This is why it just integrates in. Um, you can use, obviously, different logging tools. Most runtimes will have logging inbuilt that you can make use of. So it should be fairly easy to be able to implement this. I won't go into that in too much detail, because you're probably already doing it. OK, metrics. That's, this was the other one. Metrics are much more malleable to sort of mathematical and probabilistic and statistical transformations. So being able to sample, being able to aggregate, summarize, and find correlation across those metrics. So they're a lot more useful when it comes to understanding the behavior of an application over time, not just like a log in a particular moment in time. So it really gives us that insight over time as to how our application is behaving. It can include things like, for example, system error rates, CPU utilization, request rates. Really, there's a whole plethora of different metrics that you can create and collect for your application. Metrics are also better suited to things like trigger alerts, like running queries against an in-memory or time series database is far more efficient, not to mention more reliable. Um, the only thing is, is that this doesn't, again, this doesn't cover all, which we'll get onto in a minute. The way that you can implement metrics, a really great tool that you can utilize is MicroProfile. Who's come across MicroProfile in the room? Hands, I'm going to see if you're awake here. Seriously, no hands? Yeah, I get a wave, thank you. Oh my goodness, there's hardly anyone else. I'm going to look this way, no? OK, so I'm glad I got an intro slide. Welcome to MicroProfile. Um, this is a community-driven specification which is really designed to help anyone using Java or Jakarta EE uh, applications, building those applications, to make them effective for the cloud. So it offers all of these sort of add-on APIs and um, specifications, I guess, to your application. We kind of categorize them into these three categories. So we've got at the bottom here, we've got the core APIs. Then we've got the APIs that are to do with sort of integration. And then on top, we've got the observability APIs. A lot of these APIs are actually shared in common, especially the core ones, with Jakarta EE. So you might see some commonalities there, some shared APIs, like, for example, JaxRS, JSONB, JSONP. Um, they are shared with Jakarta EE. So the two communities work quite closely together. Um, and a lot of the committers are committers to the other project as well. Um, Emily Zhang, a colleague of mine, she did a talk earlier today. Yesterday? Yesterday. Time has flown by. Yesterday on MicroProfile. So if you do want to go into it in more detail, check out that recording. Or otherwise, we've got lots of resources. And you can go to microprofile.io, which shows you all about it. The key part here is that this is a specification. So you will need an implementation to actually make use of it. Um, and there are lots of different implementations out there. So this is a list of some of the compatible implementations you can use. 
And this is the nice thing about using MicroProfile, is that it's not locked in to one vendor. There are lots of different vendors who support it and who implement it. And that means that if you need to change your runtime at any point, you can just switch over to another compatible implementation. So you could switch from Quarkus to Bayara to Liberty to whatever you want to use. So it's quite nice having that sort of flexibility that we talked about that we want from cloud native applications. One of the APIs that MicroProfile, metric, MicroProfile offers is metrics. Um, this really aims, this specification was designed to be able to provide a unified way for different microprofile servers to export the monitoring data that we want to be able to access um, to different management agents and also to the Java API. Um, so this is basically how we can make use of metrics. And, it, and it's nice because the, um, by default, micro, microprofile metrics uh, can be used uh, in a Prometheus format, for example. Um, to be able to use it with things like the Prometheus monitoring tool as well. So this is metrics. It can provide us with a greater insight into data over time, basically how our application is behaving over a period of time. However, it doesn't give us insight into how our microservices are integrating together. So if we have a request that goes through multiple microservices, how do we know where the root cause is if it were to go wrong at any point, how do we know that our application microservices are working well together in this distributed environment? And this is where traces can be really helpful, specifically in this case, distributed traces, because we have a distributed environment. So distributed traces is a monitoring technique that really links the operations and requests that occur between multiple services. So it allows us to be able to trace, hence the name, the path of an end-to-end -end request as it moves from one service to the other, letting us pinpoint errors to a particular bottleneck in individual services, for example, that might be negatively affecting the overall system. So really understanding where in our system things are going wrong in what is a very interconnected and interdependent system. Without tracing, it can be really difficult to actually pinpoint the cause of perform performance problems in a distributed system. So it really helps us to be able to improve the visibility of our application health and enables us to debug effectively. Now, when it comes to tracing, there are some key concepts that you need to be aware of and be able to understand to understand how you can actually implement it in your system. So I'm just going to cover some of those key concepts now. One is, what is a trace? I kind of just explained that one. A trace just represents multiple requests, and it consists of multiple spans. This is what I mean by there's a lot of terminology. Spans are representative of single operations within a request. So a span usually contains things like a name, a time-related data, log messages, and metadata to be able to give us insight into what's occurring within that transaction. So you can see in my diagram here, the individual spans are shown in like ready pink. Um, and then we've got the trace that goes over multiple spans right at the bottom in orange here. So that gives us more information about that. Um, so this gives us an insight into how this is going across multiple microservices. Then we have on top of this context, and this is where traces really come into their element in providing this context. Context is an immutable object that is contained within the span, so within that span data. And it's essentially, it's, it allows us to identify the unique request that essentially each span is a part of. So this data is required to be able to move trace information across service boundaries. So normally it consists of two parts. You've got the trace ID and you've got the parent ID. The trace ID allows us to understand, OK, these three spans are all part of the same trace. They all happen with the same request. The parent ID allows us to understand, OK, where did this request originate from? What was the microservice before this? So that we can understand where it went wrong and why, which particular microservice is the bottleneck. So this context is really what allows us to be able to gain insight into where in our distributed system things are going wrong. So really gaining visibility and observability at a very low level. So this, this sort of context is, is very important. So those are the key parts behind distributed traces. So we've got logs, metrics, and distributed traces. Now that we know what they are, why they're important, why we need them, how do we actually enable them? And this is where projects like OpenTelemetry can be really helpful. Has anyone come across OpenTelemetry before? A few hands, a couple hands, awesome. OK, there's a couple of people. Bear with me if you've come across it. I'm just going to give a general intro just to give everyone else up to speed. And then we'll go into the deep dive of how we use it. So in the past, um, in the way in which code was instrumented would really vary 
because each observability backend would require you to have, it has its own implementation libraries and agents for emitting data to the tools. It basically meant there was no standardized data format for sending data to an observability backend. As well as this, if a company chose to switch observability backends, it meant they had to re-instrument all of their code and configure new agents just to be able to emit telemetry data. So it was a lot of hassle, a lot of work, a lot of effort. So there was work done to be able to essentially make a standard so that we didn't have these issues going forward. And this is where open telemetry came in. It was really built around this smart idea of you know, every Java project uses a lot of standards and open source components, things like JDBC, serverlets, you might be using Apache Tomcat, Hibernate, whatever it is. What if we could manipulate the bytecode of such libraries to be able to inject telemetry data? So this is kind of where this originates. Um, the important part here is to consider that um, it, this essentially, this project is designed to be a standard. It's a collection of different tools, APIs, and SDKs to be able to allow you to instrument, generate, collect, and export that telemetry data. Now, one note here is that open telemetry is not a complete observability backend. So you will still need to plug it in to backends like, for example, Jaeger or Prometheus. It doesn't replace those tools. What it allows us to do is to be able to have this pluggable architecture that enables you to add different technology formats and, and protocols, et cetera, and they're all supported in the open source. Um, and you can use metrics formats like Prometheus, for example, like we did before. So it's a really handy way of having that single standard. It originated from other standards that we had. So previously, we had things like open census and open tracing. Anyone come across those? Less people, cool. Well, good, because they're, like, they're not supported anymore. So <laughs> don't go near them. Um, stick with open telemetry, please. Um, this is essentially open tracing was provided. It provided a vendor neutral API for sending telemetry data to a backend. But the awkward part was it relied on developers to implement their own libraries to meet the specification. Whereas Open Census provided a set of language-specific libraries that developers could use to instrument their code and send it to any one of their supported backends. The issue with this is that that's still not one single standard. That was the issue. We still had multiple standards. It really wasn't very helpful because people were using different standards. So now all of this effort was put in place to be able to create this one single standard, which is now Open Telemetry. Um, so yeah. This was merged in 2019. It's now it's a CNCF incubating project, and it really was designed to take the best of both worlds from these projects. So please stick with open telemetry. D don't start a new project with open sensors or open tracing. Stick with open telemetry. The way that it works is a little bit like this. So this is kind of the architecture behind how open telemetry works as a, as a system. Um, we love acronyms in tech, so I do try and explain every acronym. Um, here we have OTLP. This is short for the Open Telemetry Protocol. Um, and this is a specification that basically describes the encoding, the transport, and the delivery mechanism of that telemetry data between different telemetry sources. Um, that can be like intermediate nodes, for example, like collectors and telemetry backends. In the middle here is where we have the OTEL collector. This is a vendor agnostic implementation on how to receive, process, and export that telemetry data. It's usually a single binary that can be deployed as an agent or a gateway. Now, the nice thing is, is that this can implement with lots of different backend and sort of um, collecting data systems. So if we take a closer look into that hotel collector, the architecture looks a little bit like this. Um, so as I said, it's a vendor agnostic implementation of how we receive, process, and export that telemetry data. Basically, what it does is it removes the need to run and operate and maintain multiple agents and collectors. It gives us that one standard like I was talking about. It helps us with improved scalability, and it supports the open source observability data formats like Jaeger, Prometheus, FluentBit, whatever it is you might be using. Um, and it allows us to be able to send to one or more open source or commercial backends. It's basically the default location to which instrumentation libraries export their telemetry data. It looks a little bit funny on the board. Can you guys see the background, or does it all just look like words on a white background? Words on a white background. OK, I apologize for that. My screen looks very different. Um, so I can see boxes around these words with arrows. So um, I'll upload my slides afterwards, and hopefully you can see it a little bit clearer then. But essentially, what we have here is we have our different sort of sources. So these are the receivers, and that's how we get data into the open telemetry um, collector. 
Generally, a receiver accepts data in a specified format. It then translates it into the collector's internal format and passes it to the processors and exporters defined in the application pipeline. Um, so you can see here that we've got the receivers, you've got the label on the left-hand side, and the exporters on the right-hand side. And again, we can use lots of different formats. We can use OTLP, but we can also use Jaeger and Prometheus as well. You might be wondering, under what circumstances would you use a collector to send data as opposed to having just each service send data directly to the back end? Um, for trying out and getting started with OpenTelemetry, sending your data directly to a back end is a great way to get value quickly. Don't get me wrong, like it's a valid method. However, um, in development or small scale environment, you can get decent results without a collector. But in general, we recommend using a collector alongside your service because it allows you to offload data quickly, and the collector can take care of handling additional retries, batching, encryption, or even sensitive data filtering. So it basically takes care of all of that admin for you and allows you to have that single sort of source in which you're collecting. Um, so we would recommend, if you are using this in enterprise, try and, and implement the collector. Um, that would be our recommendation. OK, so that's open telemetry. Again, this has kind of all been quite high level, though. Like, it's all been sort of theoretical. This is just a specification. How do we make use of it? Well, we can use implementations. So here we have microprofile telemetry. So this is another one of the APIs that you can make use of from the microprofile specification. This is a really new um, addition to the microprofile spec. It only came in in the most recent version of microprofile, um, which was only released earlier this year. So it was introduced in MicroProfile 6, and it adopts open telemetry tracing. One thing to note here is that open telemetry enables logs, metrics, and distributed traces. At the moment, MicroProfile is only implementing the tracing part of that, not the logs and the metrics, because uh, they already have MicroProfile metrics as a separate API, and there's work being done to try and sort of collaborate between the two open source communities to be able to enable that but it's not yet happened. So it is just focused on tracing for just now. Um, it offers a set of APIs and SDKs and tooling, like I mentioned, and it is specifically designed for the creation and management of that telemetry data, in this case, specifically traces. And you can see it added there in my diagram. This is the, the only new API that was added in, in MicroProfile 6. There are different ways that you can instrument microprofile telemetry. You can have either automatic, manual, or agent instrumentation. So for automatic, if you're already using things like Jakarta RESTful Web Services or microprofile REST client, then it's automatically enlisted in distributed tracing. So you can kind of already automatically enable it through that um, already. We've got also got manual instrumentation. So for that, you can, it can be added via annotations, so things like uh, with span or via CDI injection, so with at inject, for example, either tracer or span, depending on what you're injecting. Um, and we can use programmatic lookup as well. With agent instrumentation, you can use open telemetry Java instrumentation project to gather the telemetry data without any code modification. Now, in my demo today, I'm going to be showcasing the first and the second implementation. So that's automatic and manual. I'm not going to be going over the agent instrumentation. That is a further step just because of time. So if you do want to check it out, please go and check it out from the links that I provide later. The way that it works is a little bit like this. So here we're showing uh, two services that both have applications running on Open Liberty, and we're utilizing MicroProfile Telemetry, and we've got that installed. So the requests and the responses generate spans, and the path between the services are monitored uh, using their context. Like I explained with those traces, the context is the key part there. The spans are then exported to a dedicated backend service. Uh, so in this case, we're utilizing any of these, whether it's Jaeger, Zipkin, et cetera. And that leads me on to the second uh, step, that second step that we had earlier. So now that we've done the instrumentation, we need to make sure that we're exporting, and I'll showcase exporting in the demo. Um, so we can export data that MicroProfile collects to Jaeger or Zipkin. Really, the choice is yours. Um, Open, Open Telemetry also provides a very simple logging exporter, so you can check whether spans are created by viewing that data in your console. Uh, this can be quite helpful for debugging, but as I said, I'm not going into this too much because these tools already exist. Um, and then visualization, again, this is important to understand the insights we're gaining from this data. There are loads of different visualization tools you can use. Um, for example, Grafana, you might be using Kibana, for example, or Prometheus, although it's not really intended as a dashboarding solution, but you might be making use of that to visualize. 
Um, we've got some blogs here. So for example, a friend of mine, Sebastian Dashner, he's created this blog on how to utilize OpenLibertry with uh, telemetry data for Prometheus and Grafana. So check that out if you're interested. It looks a little bit like this. Um, so you know, when we're collecting data, it is important that we're able to be able to visualize it in useful formats. So depending on what you're collecting will depend on what tool you want to actually utilize. Um, we've got the Liberty Grafana dashboard here. There's also Prometheus, uh, which we're showing some metrics at the top there. Um, and then we've also got Kibana on your right-hand side here. So just to give you an idea of the fact that you might want to use a different tool depending on the data you're collecting and what you're trying to visualize. OK, demo time, because we all love a demo. Um, so for this demo, I'm using Open Liberty. Anyone heard of Open Liberty? <laughs> I'm not going to count you because you're my friend. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, a good hand. Thank you for waving. Lovely to meet you. Um, if you've not, oh, hand over there. Thank you. All the way. Um, so Open Liberty is, it's on my t-shirt, wearing proudly. Um, it is an open source cloud native runtime. So I'm going to ask a different question. Who's come across WebSphere? Still no hands? I mean, yeah, same people. Yep, yep. Few more hands over here. OK. So WebSphere was sort of the legacy application server that was developed by IBM. In 2014, they kind of realized that it was a bit clunky, a bit big, a bit bulky, a bit difficult for developers to use. So we created Liberty, which is a really modular cloud native runtime that enables you to be able to pick and choose the APIs that you need so that you can make your memory and throughput more efficient. In 2017, that was then open sourced to Open Liberty. And that's the product I'm essentially talking about here. So the whole point was it really focuses on code. It enables us to make really fast and iterative changes using things like dev mode. So has anyone heard of um, Quarkus Hot Reload? No, no, <laughs> says the guy talking on Quarkus. Um, if you've heard of Quarkus Hot Reload, it's a really similar function. Uh, dev mode allows us to be able to essentially automatically pick up changes that occur in our code and automatically sort of redeploy those classes so we don't have to tear down our whole application and get it started again. So we can see those changes iteratively. Um, ready for containers and enables things like true to production testing. So it's a really cool tool. Check it out. Um, follow us on social media if you want, because I run it. And I'll say hi. So please do. Um, and these are some of the things. If you want to take a closer look at this, this is some of the things we offer as sort of integrations with Open Liberty. But for this demo today, we're going to be using Open Liberty with MicroProfile Telemetry. This is open source. So if you do want to check it out, it's all on GitHub. Go and check it out on there. We're also developing a guide at the moment. So that should hopefully be released imminently because it's finished. It's just waiting review, as most things in code. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's coming out soon. And it will enable you to be able to try this out for yourself in our cloud-hosted environment. So I'll show you that later on. But essentially, here is the demo. So we're using Visual, Visual Studio Code for this. Um, and we're essentially using Jaeger um, and Zipkin. Uh, if you want to use Zipkin, you can. But in this demo, we're using Jaeger. So to do that, we've got to get the back end started first. So we're using the Jaeger um, getting started instructions for that. But you can use the Zipkin quick start if you really want to use that instead. So here, we're just cloning the repo that we have. Again, as I said, it's open source. So feel free to go and have a look at it yourself. Um, but essentially, we're just cloning this down, and then we're going to CD into the directory. Cool. Um, perfect. We're just going to open up in Visual Studio Code. So what you'll see here is we're actually using the same system here, the same application that we have in each of our guides. So it's a really basic application, because it's not designed to represent a full enterprise system. It's deliberately simple, so that you don't have to worry about understanding everything that's going on in this code. You can just focus on learning the technology that you're learning. So in this, we have two microservices, system and inventory. The system microservice just scrapes data every 15 minutes on your system. The inventory microservice then receives data from the system microservice and has a list of all your systems and all of that most recent data that's been sent. Um, we can then access that inventory list through a REST endpoint. So pretty simple, just two microservices, but it gives you an idea of sort of communication between the two and how we can enable um, different tools. Oh, I've restarted, sorry. Let's skip. OK. So as I said, I'm just going to be showcasing the manual and the automatic instrumentation today. So this is for the manual. Oh, did my mic just go? OK. Oh, 
Sorry. I feel like I just woke everyone up there. I apologize for that. I was so ready to shout. Um, OK, so what we're doing here, I'm going to pause this just to <laughs> catch up with where I was there. Um, so essentially, what we're doing here is really enabling. The first thing we need to do is make sure that we've got the prerequisites in place that are required for this. So third-party APIs have to be made visible to our app in the server.xml. Um, and the OTEL API and OTEL instrumentation annotations need to be provided as dependencies in our build path. So in this case, um, we've got them in the pom.xml. So let's keep going. Oh, it's a video, so I don't know if I can. Uh, I'm trying to figure. <laughs> How's this? Better? Better? Perfect. Thank you. All right. Now can I play? Yes, perfect. OK. So that was in our server.xml. We were just adding those dependencies in. Um, and here is the dependency that I was mentioning, that microprofile API and instrumentation annotations that I need to add into my pom.xml. So if we head into the pom.xml here, um, you can see several of our dependencies here, for example. And we're just going to add them in to this section. Um, we've got two dependencies there that we're using. So now that we've added those in, we've got our prerequisites, we're now ready to be able to instrument our code manually to create traces. So we're going to head into our inventory resource uh, class, where we're going to inject a tracer and a span object, um, which will be used to create spans. So we're going to head into that class now, so into Java, um, and then into inventory resource.java class. Um, and in that, Yep, we're in there. Perfect. So we're just going to inject our tracer and span, like I was mentioning. In this case, we're creating a span called getting properties, which adds an event before the system service is called. Um, we're just basically uncommenting the code there, because we already had it in there. We can also create new spans by annotating in any Jakarta CDI beans using the with span annotation as well. Um, so in this, oh, this is the getting properties. So here we are. We're just uncommenting that and save. So you can see we're using annotations. If you're familiar with MicroProfile, it pretty much all works with annotations. So the next thing we're going to do is utilize that annotating method with any Jakarta CDI bean that I mentioned. We can use the annotation with span for this. So that's what we've got in our code here, that with span. At the moment, we're not really doing much with it. We've just got a void. Um, but we're just going to add that in for the time being. Um, in this case, we're creating another span, and we're giving it the name list. So let's just add that in. Again, we've already got it in there, so we're just uncommenting for the time being, um, just because we had it in our original repository. Um, so this is the public void. Yep, we've got the at span attribute that we're making use of, that other annotation. Cool. So we'll first check again that we can successfully access the endpoint to be able to ensure our microservice is actually working. So here we've got a second one. This is the one with list. So add that in. I'm a little bit ahead, sorry. Cool. So adding in that list annotation. And now that we've got that, we can now make sure that it's all working. So the first thing we need to do is make sure that we've got our application up and running um, so that we can actually access that endpoint. So we're just going to use the terminal here. We could use dev mode, for the, but for this, we're just literally doing a Maven run um, just to make it simple. So here we're just doing Maven Liberty run. Get that up and running. You should see uh, Liberty, the Liberty message, which basically says it's ready for a smarter world, which shows that it's up and running and ready to go. Now we're just going to CD into the inventory. And again, we're going to get that up and running as well, uh, because we need both up and running for this particular part. Cool. And now we're going to go back to the local host and check that we can still access that to ensure that our microservice is still up and running. So you can see, yep, we can still access that. Um, and we can still utilize. We're utilizing the Jager UI here to be able to sort of see the different um, endpoints and sort of the different uh, metrics that we're collecting. So going back to the Jager UI, again, you can use Zipkin if you really want to. We're just using Jager in this instance. Um, just head to that local URL, um, get that up and running. Hopefully, yeah, I think it's all within this corner. So let me know if anything goes off screen. We're going to go to the inventory. Um, and then here we go. What you can see is we've created a span there with some traces that you can see in the bottom here. And we've done that using the manual implementation. 
Um, and then we can get more information on it just by sort of heading into that UI um, to find out more information. I've realized that as I was doing this demo, I switched between two demos, so I apologize for that. Um, this was the manual implementation. You can also have the automatic implementation as well, um, which was the previous demo that I skipped. But in the interest of time, I'm just going to keep going. Um, so if you do want to try it yourself, then do visit the GitHub URL that I mentioned, um, which takes you to uh, the GitHub repo where you can follow the steps. We've got instructions. If you want to find out about our guides, follow us on social media. We post whenever we produce new guides. So that guide will be coming out soon. OK, so despite the hiccup with the demo, which I apologize for, hopefully what I've shown you is that you know, we're entering this world of increased complexity and that because we're becoming more complex, both our infrastructure and our architecture and our applications, it is really critical for us to have effective observability to be able to monitor and understand how our applications are behaving and performing in this complex environment. And the nice thing is, is that you're not alone in this. We're not expecting you to create your own implementations. There are lots of open source tools available to be able to help you with this. Um, so take a look at things like the standards like OpenTelemetry and like the implementations like MicroProfile Telemetry to be able to make use of this in your own applications. As if I haven't given you enough links already, there are more links because we love to research and do homework. Um, so if you did want to find out more, these are some useful links to be able to follow. Um, a recap of what observability really means. Um, we've got a blog there, around an article around how to use OpenTelemetry with MicroProfile, um, and then one at the bottom there for uh, tracing with MicroProfile using OpenLiberty, which takes you through the steps that I was doing wrong, sorry, in that demo. As I mentioned, we've got some guides. Uh, these are some observability guides we already have. So if you're interested in utilizing things like Zipkin, Prometheus, Jaeger, whatever it might be, uh, we've already got guides up there that you can follow um, if you really want to have a go. And as I said, OpenTelemetry is coming soon. The nice thing is, is that you don't necessarily have to do them on your local machine. So if you've got a restricted machine, for example, and it's difficult for you to try out new technologies, then you can use our um, IDE in our browser. So we've basically got a cloud-hosted environment that you can try this all out in. It's based on loosely on Thea, um, and it provides all the instructions, the terminal, and the IDE within one environment. So all you need is a browser, um, which hopefully everyone has on their machines. As I said, please do connect with us to find out about when this, these guides are coming out, to give us your feedback, your comments. I promise I'll say hi if you say hi. Um, I'd love to have more people to talk to on social media. Um, so do follow us if you have a chance. Um, and with that, I'm going to say thanks very much. I'm sorry the demo didn't work to plan, uh, but hopefully it was helpful. And I'll be around for the rest of the day. I appreciate you guys staying with me throughout that whole presentation and staying till the end of the second day. I know it's been a long couple of days, a lot of learning. So thank you very much. Um, I appreciate it. Thanks.